welcome to NDTV Profit. You're joining us on this uh, special broadcast where we're discussing uh, the latest minutes from the Monetary Policy Committee meeting that happened earlier in June. Uh, now, this was the, probably the first time that two members have voted in favor of a rate cut, uh, while the rest of the Monetary Policy Committee has been uh, steadfast on their uh, on their uh, vote uh, on maintaining uh, the repo rate at 6.5% uh, and the stance as withdrawal for accommodation. Uh, I'm joined today uh, by, with my colleague uh, Pallavi Nahata, and the two of us are going to be talking to Dr. Ashima Goyal, uh, who is one of the external members of the MPC. Dr. Goyal, welcome uh, to this conversation. It's a pleasure talking to you, ma'am. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you, just for the benefit of our viewers, of course, the minutes are very detailed, uh, but just for the benefit of our viewers, if you can tell us a little bit about uh, the thought process behind uh, this uh, ask for a rate cut. You're one of the two members who asked for it. Uh, and this. Uh, change in stance uh, that you're seeking? You're saying the neutral stance is better right now. Well, the neutral stance have, has been used in the past as enabling movement in either direction or a pause. Yeah, so therefore, before we can cut, we need to change to neutral. Yeah, it doesn't need more than that at present. And uh, the, my reason for asking for a rate cut is that we have space and I think in the Indian situation, since inflation has been falling, we have space. And in the Indian situation, where we need to increase employment and um, grow faster in order to create more employment, we should use what space is available. Uh, hi, ma'am. I do want to ask you about uh, the sacrifice ratio that you spoke about uh, in your minutes, that being high given where we are in terms of the neutral uh, interest uh, rate, uh, and uh, also the impact on growth. You also do believe that despite resilient growth in the Indian economy, uh, potential growth can still be higher, and as such, uh, Possibly easing in uh, the current uh, uh, cycle uh, can help boost growth. Uh, so I do want to understand, uh, you know, uh, what you've spoken about regarding the sacrifice ratio uh, and uh, how that could, uh, you know, how a cut could help boost growth. Yes, in you know, the Indian situation, a lot of estimates of aggregate demand and supply that I've also done, others have done, show that aggregate supply is elastic. You know? That follows because we have large uh, underemployment and we are in a kind of growth transition where uh, people are transiting to higher productivity jobs. That means that when we have large uh, capital flows, uh, a lot of infrastructure investment has been going on. That means that you can increase output and employment without it leading, leading to inflation. But what happens in our Indian context where we are still dependent on food, a large part of the consumption basket is food, and food, and we are dependent on oil imports. So these are volatile commodities. So over the, we have been seeing, you know, situations of volatility because of geopolitics affecting oil prices because of um, various climatic uh, effects on vegetable and other, but and that is why even though the inflation projections were coming lower, were around four, uh, between four and five percent, and there was some space to cut, but we were watching because we wanted to see whether these kind of supply uh, shocks uh, lead to a rise in headline inflation, a persistent rise in inflation. But that has not happened. Even the heat wave did not upset food prices that much that they could raise headline inflation. Over the last year, we've seen that oil prices. Now, it seems that um, there is not so much uh, monopoly power anymore with OPEC. So despite their production cuts, oil is softening. There are other centers of production. There's a substitution towards green sources of energy. And overall, with the economy becoming more diverse, and commodities taking a smaller share, substitutes available, the earlier kind of volatility and impact in commodity prices and their impact on headline inflation is reducing. So over the last year, we have watched this and we have seen that spikes have had only a temporary impact on inflation. And I, I don't think we need to wait until inflation reaches four to cut, because if we are at 6.5, in 
expected inflation is 4.5. That's already a 2% real rate. We, over the last uh, couple of years, um, inflation and the real rate at 1% has helped bring core inflation down. So you don't need a higher real interest rate. And in the Indian situation of elastic aggregate supply, this interest rate and elastic high demand elasticity. We have a lot of young people buying things on credit. We have housing, which is quite vibrant. So the aggregate demand elasticity is high. In such a situation, the real repo affects output and growth more than it affects inflation. Right. Uh, Dr. Goyal, one of the arguments placed by, uh, you know, uh, one of your fellow members uh, of this MPC uh, was that this uh, this uh, real rate uh, sort of increase because of a drop in inflation or a temporary drop in inflation, uh, it doesn't really mean much in the long term. Uh, how, how do you tackle that issue? See, the dip we are seeing, inflation is probably falling to around 3%. And that's a transient, and then after that, it starts to rise again. But this is a base effect, you know? So if you ignore that dip, overall, the trajectory is downwards, a slow downwards trajectory. So any temporary uh, change, uh, you know, fall and then rise is only due to base effects. Momentum, which is more important, which is month-on-month -month change, continues to, be re continues to reduce. Okay, okay. Uh, ma'am, I do want to ask you about, you know, uh, there's been, especially post the last MPC meeting, uh, there's been a fair bit of speculation on whether uh, India's central bank can possibly uh, move before the Fed does in terms of cutting rates. Uh, and uh, while the central bank has uh, continuously maintained uh, that their decisions and the MPC's decisions are led primarily by domestic developments, uh, how do you uh, view uh, the possibility uh, and the chances of uh, the MPC uh, possibly cutting rates before the Fed does? I think the MPC may have been communicating over uh, many months that um, we have independence from the Fed. You know, the inflation differentials are falling. Our debt flows, which are interest sensitive, are capped at 6% of the market and currently of the market turnover and currently they're much lower, right? So interest sensitive uh, flows are very low. Now for equity flows which dominate cross-border flows, they do return to the US when Fed rates rise because they get risk-free higher rates by investing in US treasuries. But they do not come here to invest in government debt. So raising interest rates is not going to keep them here. Raising interest rates tends to lower equity prices. Yeah? And, and uh, a, a vibrant equity market and high growth prospects is what attracts them here. So the Indian conditions are different. We are not so sensitive to the interest differential. In Europe, they are. Japan is so, and Japan, but even then the central banks are moving very differently from the US Fed because they have other buffers. They, they allow their exchange rates to move. We have very large reserves. And in emerging markets, so you can have too much volatility in exchange rates if you let them take the whole shock. And that raises the interest premium, the uncovered interest parity, the UIP premium or the risk premium for emerging markets. So what the Reserve Bank is doing, kind of, uh, you know, allowing the rate to be market determined, the preventing excess movement and reducing volatility has re resulted in a reduction in the risk premium. So part of the interest differential is due to this risk premium. The risk premium has fallen, meaning that the interest differential can safely fall. So there are many, many reasons why we have degrees of freedom from US Fed rates. And we can change rates to suit our domestic cycle. 
Dr. Goyal, one of the statements uh, that you made uh, in, as part of this MPC Minutes uh, it's sort of caught my eye, which was uh, that status quoism is being praised as, uh, as pragmatism, or, you know, I'm just paraphrasing here, but I'm just trying to understand from you, uh, you know, uh, the reason probably uh, status quo is being maintained is because there's very low chances of you being wrong and uh, very high chance of you being right. So uh, w how do you, how do you uh, look at it from that point of view? See, the question is that there are so many moving parts in any in any economy and some things will go right some things will go wrong but uh, here uh, see what affects behavior is real rates so by doing nothing as inflation comes down the nominal repo rate which was at the correct level when inflation was higher becomes incorrect right it is the real repo rate that affects investment, consumption, and so on. So by doing nothing, you're actually doing the wrong thing, right? You're leading to distortions in real rates. And you know, like so many people are acknowledging that Indian macroeconomic policy has done very well after the pandemic. And one major reason is that we have kept both real interest rate and real exchange rate near equilibrium levels. So again, that, and that smooths short cycles, it's counter cyclical, which monetary policy should be. Unfortunately, in emerging markets with a very high volatility, policy ends up just aggravating those shocks. It is pro cyclical normally. But India has enough buffers, reserves, enough diversity, enough degrees of freedom now to be able to smooth shocks. So a sign that you're smoothing shocks if it is in your keeping your real rates at the equilibrium level, the level required to have the best effects on the economy. Okay, uh, ma'am, I do want to ask you about uh, you know, possibly the next big macro event is the upcoming budget, and I do want to ask you about your thoughts uh, uh, in terms of expectations. While there does seem to be a fair bit of consensus on where the government is headed uh, on both the capex as well as fiscal deficit, uh, is there? Do you believe there's a case to be made uh, for measures? targeted at boosting consumption, especially in case of the rural uh, sector, even though we have seen signs of recovery in that space. Uh, but yes, consumption uh, in the rural space as well as urban. And uh, also, uh, what are your expectations in terms of welfare schemes? This time, could we possibly expect the government uh, hiking its allocation towards some of its uh, welfare schemes? I think this government has chosen to be fiscally conservative. There was a lot of pressure during the pandemic for opening of the fiscal tax. That time I was in the PMEAC. And, uh, uh, you know, remember we are 1.4 billion people. Now, suppose you send them checks the way the US president was sending. Uh, our deficit would have ballooned to 50%. And then what would have happened to foreign inflows? They would all have become outflows. Those risk premiums that are coming down would have shot up. Uh, we uh, Interest rates would have shot up. Cost of borrowing would have shot up. Yeah? So this government chose to give a fiscal stimulus by increasing the quality of expenditures increasing the share of investment of infrastructure that improves the supply side and reduces the bottlenecks and supply side volatilities to which the economy is subject. Yeah? And their welfare schemes also are uh, oriented towards building, they, they do protect the vulnerable, it's very good use of our large food stocks to give free food and subsidized food uh, during the pandemic. But uh, many of these welfare schemes, these housing or sanitation or gas, they, they uh, improve assets available with the poor. They improve public services, you know, which are very important for the poor to become independent, you know, to be able to take part in uh, growing opportunities in India. And some of these schemes are self-limiting in the sense after you have 100% sanitation or piped water, 
know, then that money is released. So one of the things to note is that when you have revenue buoyancy and high growth, the fiscal deficit number might stay at five percentage, but you have much more to spend in absolute amounts. So you can um, give help to the vulnerable, have schemes that stimulate consumption, and at the same time, increase investment expenditure. But the government has to be very careful, and I think they will be to avoid the trap that we fell into in the 2000s, when we had very high growth, buoyant revenues, but this was used to just pump money into consumption, into agriculture, uh, you know, raising uh, all sorts of, and, and as a result, after that, we had double digit real, you know, we had the classic wage price loop and very high inflation, and our economy was labeled as a fragile economy, double deficits in early, to zero tens. Right. So I think they are taking the opposite uh, um, opposite path, a much more sustainable uh, path that will help the economy um, grow sustainably. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Goyal, for joining us uh, on this conversation. As always, a pleasure talking to you, ma'am. Uh, and that was uh, Professor uh, Dr. Ashima Goel, uh, one of the external members uh, of the Monetary Policy Committee, joining us and talking to us after the MPC minutes. Thank you so much for joining us. Do continue watching NDTV Profit for further news and updates.